tunnel position is still a much talked about concept and I think what they're talking about now is footprint restoration or an anatomical reconstruction, not whether you do a double or single bundle, but trying to put the graph back where the anatomy um, was in the first place. Comes with that a knowledge of surgical anatomy and accuracy and then really evaluating ourselves after surgery with x-rays which aren't perfect, but probably moving more towards CT scans in the future which are difficult to get and expensive. Sorry, um, and the um, uh, not expensive, um, uh, more radiation. ACL failures are becoming uh, commonly associated with anatomy. So as you become more anatomical with your reconstruction, some people are seeing more failures around the world. And again, failures are more common in adolescent uh, uh, people and females. Registry data, lots of registries are set up around the world. The Danish registry have an interesting uh, little blip in the recent uh, figures where if you do an anteromedial portal reconstruction, there is an increased risk of failure. And now, just an update on our registry, we're starting a pilot study around different centres in Australia now with a view to setting up our registry in the future. There's much less single bundle, double bundle debate and fewer people are performing double bundles around the world. At the last ACL study group this year, there was a large discussion about surgical uh, nomenclature and moving more towards an anatomical system of describing points and where you are inside the knee and I'll talk about that in a second. Biological ACL, uh, there's still work being done on trying to repair the ACL, collagen implants, lots of work on re retaining the stump and even things like PRP to enhance healing. Osteoarthritis uh, after ACL injury and surgery is a big topic, uh, the concept of restoring knee homeostasis, symmetrical range of motion. Don Shelbourne presented a really excellent paper with 10 to 20 year follow up on the, the correlation between range of motion, symmetrical range of motion and osteoarthritis and found that if you don't restore the range of motion you increase the risk of osteoarthritis and the medical management of uh, osteoarthritis as well, trying to prevent it more than anything else. Return to sport, only 60 to 70 percent of our people or well, patients return to their previous level of sport and so the trend now is even in America to delay the return to full activities and the development of testing protocols to uh, ascertain whether our athletes can return to sport. Outcomes, there's still lots of work trying to be done on devising an outpatient pivot shift measurement and trying to test rotation in the outpatient department. Clearly we need to manage other pathology, that's also a big point, meniscal tears, cartilage, uh, collateral ligaments and alignment. Synthetic ligaments, uh, at the ACL study group they were widely condemned, only two surgeons out of 150 people present had used the last in the last 12 months, that was one Australian surgeon and one guy from China. So what I thought I'd like to do is just briefly go through again the anatomy, surgical anatomy and where we are in the knee when we're performing an ACL reconstruction, a little bit about a surgical technique, uh, anatomical failures and outcomes. So we know anatomy is important. Um, the ACL, as we all know, has two functional bundles, an AM and a posterior lateral. Their tension and their orientation changes with uh, flexion and extension. Had a very good video if it runs, will show us that, that we've got the anteromedial bundle, uh, the, front, the posterior lateral bundle in flexion. You can see it come into play distally here. And we, we, all of us have studied this and we understand this. But this is what we see in our anatomy books and this is what we visualise uh, on MRI scans and that's the knee in extension. So in extension, the ACL attaches in the posterior aspect of the uh, femur and we know the tibia is a static point. So in uh, 90 degrees of flexion, the tibia is still in that position. Lots of work's been done on the anatomy around the world. Charlie Brown um, demonstrated this uh, quite nicely that uh, if you look at the lateral wall of the femur, the bottom 30 to th or the posterior 30 to 35 percent of the lateral wall is made up of the anterior cruciate ligament uh, uh, insertion. So when you look at this, in, an in the an anatomical world, it's easy. You've got proximal, distal, anterior, and posterior. That's Blumensatz line. That's the uh, lateral intercondylar ridge and the bifurcate ridge. And there's the ACL insertion. But when we operate in 80 or 90 degrees of flexion just put these points in again, everything changes because we've all been taught that that's out the back, that's posterior, it's the deep aspect of uh, surgery in 90 degrees of flexion and this is towards the front, it's anterior, it's shallow and this is high and superior and that's inferior and low. But they're actually not because if you go back to anatomy, 
you'll never get wrong, you'll never make a mistake. If, you, if we all use the words proximal, distal, anterior and posterior and reference it back to a flexion position, uh, you'll never be able to describe things incorrectly. The other thing is that this all changes with, um, so to sort of look at that arthroscopically, just go through a few things here. So this is the so-called 12 o'clock position over the top and you can see that what I've tried to marry here is the arthroscopic uh, picture, the uh, image intensifier shot taken at the time and where that is anatomically. Then when we look at the so-called 9 o'clock position, that's what it looks like anatomically. This is about a 10 o'clock position. This is putting a graph on the roof, on the intercondylar roof. That's what it looks like and unfortunately we're still seeing ACLs put here. And this is where the anteromedial femoral tunnel or femoral uh, position should be. So the clock face is, is an outdated philosophy and we probably should be thinking in three dimensions and it's really a Roman arch, not a clock face. It's an arch, not a circle. And it changes, our perception of this changes with our flexion. So there's a roof, there's a junction zone and there's a lateral wall. And the ACL really attaches just below the junction zone between the lateral wall and the junction zone. So if you're palpating that proximal aspect of the notch in surgery, you go to the junction zone, lateral wall come in posteriorly a, a little bit and come uh, distal a little bit, that's where your anteromedial bundle should be. So in nine degrees of flexion, that's what it looks like. So I've added these red dots to show you the insertion in nine degrees. Now in 70 degrees, it changes. Now it looks like this. So the orientation of the ACL changes when you go into 70 degrees of flexion. Then when you go into 120 degrees or further, the orientation changes again. So it's now pointing towards the roof. So if you just use, prox if you just use deep shallow, those distances and reference, point reference points will change no matter on your, with, uh, your changing flexion. But if you always use proximal, distal, anterior, posterior, you will never make an error. So we're still seeing, unfortunately, um, ACLs coming in like this. So clearly this patient has a vertical uh, anterior cruciate ligament that may restrict range of motion and it's nowhere near where the anatomy uh, is. So the so-called high noon position. We'll just go through these pretty quickly because I want to get to the video, but this is another case of a similar sort of pathology. So it's whether, the question then comes whether you should do a transtibial or an anteromedial portal technique. It probably doesn't matter. If you can do a transtibial te well, technique well, then that's okay, but it's a very difficult technique to get correct. The tibial tunnel needs to uh, start very medially and obliquely and the knee flexion angle is critical. It's a bit like playing um, uh, golf and trying to put the ball uh, into the hole going through a tunnel already. It's, uh, it, why not just uh, aim to the point in the first place? So with the AM portal, the critical thing is to mark your point in 80 to 90 degrees of flexion and then trust where you've marked. Because when you go into hyperflexion, you lose vision and I've seen lots and lots of registrars get nervous at that point. But if you trust and know where you are and look through the anteromedial portal and see you're in the right spot, when you go into flexion, uh, you can, uh, you'll get it most of the time. You do need to be careful of the medial femoral condyle when you're in uh, hyperflexion. Um, it's a bit like putting the, hole, the ball just in the hole without going through a tunnel. So positioning is important. Um, I use two bolsters, one in 80 to 90 degrees and one in hyperflexion. It's important to have uh, uh, portals uh, appropriately positioned so that you have a high, sort of more central uh, lateral portal so you can see the lateral wall, have a low um, medial anteromedial portal and I just use an oblique incision, three, uh, three hand, fingers breadths below the uh, tibial plateau to harvest. Now just going to play this short video just to hopefully demonstrate that. So this is a more chronic case, uh, leave as much of the tibial stump as we can just demonstrating that that's the, the roof, the junction zone, the lateral wall. I use a diathermic uh, distal and mark my spot. Tending more towards an anteromedial position than anything else. Looking through the anteromedial portal, making sure you're in the correct spot. So then when you go into hyperflexion with this guide, you lose vision but you've trusted your spot and you mark your, um, and you make your drill hole. This is again just looking now uh, at the same thing after passage of the suture. The tibia is a lot easier. Uh, none of the ACL attaches uh, posterior to the spine, so it's all anterior to that, and really aiming towards the posterior aspect of the anteromedial insertion point. I don't use diathermy normally because you can just go straight with a tip aimer. And then you drill 
trying to keep as much of the stump preserved as possible and then pass your graft. And then if we just move on to the second video, this is a more acute case with lots of the stump and lots of the ACL still present. And I think it's really important to, to drop your eyes towards this part of the lateral wall. In the old days, you used to take all this out and look up at the, the, uh, the roof and debride everything and, and really sort of pick the uh, tissue off the bone. You don't need to do that. If you sort of start down here and work your way superiorly or anteriorly, you can find that attach, uh, attachment point uh, pretty easily. So again, mark an 89 degrees of flexion and then move up to uh, hyperflexion to drill your tunnels. We can probably stop that there. And then in terms of stump preservation, this case really got me because this is a case at the Austin Hospital where I preserved the stump. And you can see this is the post-operative shot at six months. And here's the stump at the front here and here's the graft coming through just behind that. And it looks like it's incorporated pretty well. And we obviously don't know any tensile properties of this, but it looks, it looks uh, impressive. I think the more anatomical we are, the more failures we might see. The further we go towards the posterior lateral bundle, uh, the more graft forces uh, we place through our grafts in translation and rotation. Most studies look at control of motion, not graft forces. Dave McAllister at uh, UCLA, however, looks at graft forces a lot. And what he's found is as you go from 30 degrees of flexion with all these reconstruction single and double bundles, in every single one, 30 degrees to zero degrees of extension, you increase graft forces. As you go further towards the posterior lateral bundle, you increase them even further. And therefore, we may be seeing uh, increased forces in our grafts and increased failures potentially. And if that happens, particularly if you do double bundle surgery, you then may lose control of your antimedial bundle and have complete graft failure. Just very quickly, we've just done a recent study at La Trobe at, at the uh, MRC looking at double and single bundle patients, put them through the gate laboratory. We did low and high demand tasks, looking at total range of motion and adduction moments. The groups were symmetrical with numbers and characteristics apart from follow-up from surgery to uh, testing. And we found really no difference. In the non-operated limb, they were very symmetrical. In the operated limb, the double bundles in, um, in green here in the jog and cut activity had increased total range of motion, but when you compared to the opposite limb, they were normal. And then when you looked at the uh, uh, single bundle group, there was a statistical difference in the hop and dodge, but it was less rotation, not more. So really what we found overall was there was no difference between the groups as the activities increased in intensity, the range of motion increased, and there was no difference in adduction moments between the two groups. So in conclusion, I just, particularly to the registrars and trainees, think about the anatomy and not what that means when you're operating, so your surgical anatomy. Tunnel position on the femoral side probably errs slightly towards the anteromedial uh, tunnel position. Stump retention is uh, important if possible, and there's going to be potentially more failures, more failures as we go towards the postural bundle. And that probably means we should be delaying our uh, return to sport and test patients before we do that. This uh, single bundle, double bundle debate is probably uh, nearly over and what's probably more important is anatomical placement of the, uh, of the graphs. Thanks very much.